like the Lord is trying to get a word across to our church. I had no idea what our first service lesson was going to be, but it is right in line with what I feel like the Lord has laid on my heart. The book of 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse number seven. I'm gonna read down through verse number 10. 2 Corinthians 12 and seven said, and this is the apostle Paul speaking. And of course, then the Lord is the one speaking to the apostle Paul. But Paul said, unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given me, there was, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing, for this thorn, I besought the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Then there's what Paul said. What a real change of spirit. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, these same things he's been seeking the Lord to deliver him from. He said, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. And I want to just preach for a few moments today about perfected weakness. Perfected weakness. God bless you and you can be seated. We can define God by many things. I certainly don't have the vocabulary to come even close to exhausting the various descriptions of God. But I believe that one of the things that I have always found about God is God is a God of balance, a God of, of knowing what is right. He's a God that is just. And so the Lord knows how to bring balance into our lives. If we only had blessings, we may become proud. And uh, amen, that's the truth. It's, it's so easy to, to go this way in life but it's very difficult to go this way in life. And uh, you don't have to, uh, to, to be blessed very long to realize how those things can change your life. I don't think it's wrong to be blessed. But the mystery of human suffering will probably never be fully described or understood or maybe even solved in this lifetime the mystery of human suffering. Sometimes we know and sometimes we don't know. Sometimes we suffer just because we're human and it's just life. There's just no way, there's no way around it. It's just part and parcel. But then sometimes we suffer because we are foolish and disobedient to the Lord. And, and so there is a, a punishment of, of sorts or a correction perhaps and uh, we can see that in the lives of many, many Bible characters, not the least of which would be King David. He suffered greatly for his sins and we can find entire Psalms where David has recorded prayers of repentance and also uh, Psalms of reflection as he looked back on those seasons of his life. The consequences were painful and often the, the, uh, the discipline of God but in God's grace, he forgives sin. But also, there's not just the grace of God that has to be considered. There is also for consideration the government of God. The grace of God, he forgives. But the government of God says, whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And so we have to live with both of those. But I do believe that suffering is a tool that God uses to build character in our lives. How would we know that God can deliver us if we've never needed to be delivered? Or how can we know for a fact that God is a healer if we have never stood in that line needing a desperate touch of God? And certainly Paul was a man that was so filled with the character of God because he permitted God to mold him and to shape him even in the painful experiences of his life. So seeking the Lord and seeking the Lord and seeking the Lord 
to be delivered, to be healed, to be set free from whatever this must have been. But the Lord just said, my grace is sufficient. And so Paul said, okay, then I'll receive that and I'll allow what you allow to come in my life to shape me and to mold me into a better man. Now, Paul's weakness or Paul's uh, thorn in the flesh kept him grounded. And, and I, I believe that it's clear in scripture that God mightily used the apostle Paul. And so Paul said, well, I would rather have the revelations that are coming. I would rather have the power of God flowing in my life if it means it has to be coupled with the trouble and the peril and the pain than to divorce myself from that. He had spiritual experiences and those experiences have a way of inflating the human ego. Oh yes, they do. It doesn't take very many compliments before you start believing what people are saying. <laughs> Amen. Pride leads to a multitude of temptations and ultimately it can lead to sin. And so had Paul's heart been filled with pride, the years before him would have been filled with failure. But instead they were filled with success because he understood God is just using something here to keep me balanced. He's keeping my feet on the ground. Now, we don't know what Paul's thorn in the flesh was, and I've got some advice for you. Just forget it. You know, some people start trying to chase down all of those things. When you get to the end of it, you could still be wrong. The Bible is silent, and so let's just leave it that way. We have no idea. We could assume it was a, a physical affliction that brought distress. We could assume many, many other things. I'm sure we all have our feelings about what it could be, but we don't know for sure what it is, and that's a good thing. It's a good thing that we don't know because no matter what our sufferings may be, we can apply these lessons of Paul, the principle of Paul, amen, those things that he learned and we can apply that to our lives and be encouraged. If we knew exactly what Paul's infirmity was, then we would just think anything short of that. If we didn't have that in our life, then surely this cannot be for any good. And so it's just left open so that we can use that as a principle. God permitted Satan to afflict Paul. And by that same token, we can see in the Old Testament that he allowed and permitted Satan to afflict Job. He was there. He was given some latitude, but not full reign. And we're never gonna understand the, the origin of evil in this universe or, or, or all the purposes that God may have in mind when he permits something to come into our life. But I know one thing, he controls it all. And the Lord said to Job, or the Lord said to Satan concerning Job, he said, you can go this far and you cannot go any further. Just like he said to the sea, you can come this far and you can come no further. I'm gonna keep you in this basin. And God has the ability to control the storms of our lives to say this far and no further. I mean, we know that God controls everything, including evil, peril, pain. Everything that the enemy did to Job and everything that happened in the life of the Apostle Paul was not just permitted by God, but I think it's so important for us to understand it is controlled by God. And so whatever comes into our life, whatever storm may blow into our life, we gotta understand this, God has the key to it. He's in control of it. And he said he would not put more on us than we could bear. He would make a way of escape with those things. When we think about the persecutions that Paul faced and we think about all the things that, that, uh, that, that came in his life, many of them we, we do know about. I'm convinced many of them we know nothing about. But when you stop to think about the responsibilities that were blanketed by the ministry of the Apostle Paul, Paul had letters that he had to write. We call them epistles. They were letters that were written to the churches. He had, he had places to go and people to see. I'm not talking about to get there and glad hand people, but to establish and, and confirm the bedrock of churches. He had messages to preach and congregations to encourage. And so Paul was not a man traveling on vacation and traveling just for the mere sense of traveling. He had a lot of things to do. Amen. And so when we weigh that against all the things that he faced both physically and spiritually, we can understand that this was a serious matter. So no wonder he prayed multiple times. 
No wonder he asked the Lord, if you would remove this from me, it would make what I'm doing for you so much easier. I could move with greater ease. I could do this or I could do that. But God understood that if I allow you to just be used and I don't put anything in your life to serve as a counterweight, then one day we may be reading a much different thing about your life and ministry. And so when God permits suffering to come in our lives, I believe that there are multiple ways we can deal with that. I've watched people that had things, storms that blew in their life. They become bitter and angry and they blame God and they, they allow those things to separate them from God. I've watched people just give up and by doing so, they fail to, to reap the benefit of what God was trying to give birth to in their lives. And I would also suggest, according to Romans 8 and 28, that even those things that are not contrived of God, God can take those things that come against us and he can use them for good. Amen, he can. Others grit their teeth. They say, well, I'm just gonna make this. I will do this myself. And they're gonna make themselves endure to the end. And that seems like a courageous response. But what happens is that when we try to do this without God, we are the ones that deplete our strength and our ability. And we are the ones that fall by the wayside. That's why we've got to relinquish it to the hand of the Lord and say, Lord, I need you today. I need you to touch me and strengthen me. I don't understand why this is going on, but I will tell you, I trust you, Lord. And we're just going to keep our hand because we understand that you are perfected. Amen. In my weakness, whenever I am down to nothing, that's when I see your arm as never before. Amen. It is normal for a, a child of God. It's normal for a human being to ask for deliverance from sickness or pain or peril. But God has not obligated himself to heal every element, God, ailment. God has not obligated himself to step into every situation. Now, this is not a popular message. I'll just go ahead and warn you up front. There are some things in life we're just gonna have to build a room for because it's not going away. Amen. I know that God can. He has the ability, but that may not be his will. And when it is not his will, then we can just devote the rest of our lives to trying to figure out the whys. Or we can just say, until such time that God changes things, I'm just gonna keep my shoulders square. I'm gonna remain faithful to him. Amen, God is not obligated to do that. He may not heal, but I tell you what he will do. He'll give you grace for the season. He'll give you strength for the day. He'll give you the ability to stand upright when the winds ought to be blowing you flat to your back. God will give us the ability to march yeah. forward. Yeah. Amen. You know, there are some people today that, that would like to believe that any measure uh, uh, of affliction is just a disgrace to God. And, uh, you know, there's the name it and the claim it crowd and the prosperity crowd and on and on and on that, that says that, uh, you know, if, you're due, if you don't have enough money in the bank, you must be living wrong or if you've got some kind of ailment in your life or something is wrong, there must be sin in your life. If you're not obeying the Lord, you know, if you would start obeying the Lord rather, then you'll never be sick or you'll never need a dime. Right. Amen. That is a false doctrine. Yes, sir. Absolutely. It's not in the Bible. You can't find it in the word of God. If Paul had access to instant healing because of his relationship to God, then why didn't he use that to help those around him? Right. Amen. Amen. Many people were healed, but there were many people that were not healed. Consider a man by the name of Epaphroditus in the book of Philippians chapter two and, and beginning about verse number 25. The Bible says that this man was a fellow worker with the apostle Paul. This was an important figure in the life and the ministry of the apostle Paul. But when you start reading about his life in Philippians two, Paul said that he was sick and that he was sick near death. And God had mercy on him and he healed him, thankfully. And Paul admonished the church to receive him because he said he almost died for the work of God. Now what a, what a contrast between the apostle Paul and this man. Paul sought the Lord and, and the Lord said, my grace is sufficient, I'll help you through the day, but I'm not gonna heal you through the day. 
But here's another man sick unto death linked to the same ministry of the apostle Paul right at death's door and yet God turns and heals him. Amen, what a contrast. Paul went from paradise, that great Damascus Road experience where he, where heaven and earth met on his behalf. Paul went from paradise to pain. He went from glory to suffering. He tasted the blessings of God in heaven and then he felt, according to his own words, the buffeting of Satan. But in all this, Paul knew one thing, God is able to sustain me and he is able to meet my needs. Paul had seemingly in some way gone to heaven, but then he learned, amen, now heaven can come to me. I may not be able to get there, but it can come to me. And can I tell you, and I will tell you this morning, there are people in this house that know you have prayed for God to heal or deliver or change or whatever your circumstance may be. And that may not be changed at all from the moment you prayed until right now. But haven't you had many accounts where the heaven came down to you and just encouraged you and strengthened you and gave you the ability not only to keep standing but to keep walking. And we're here today by the grace of God. We're here today because of perfected weakness. I'm not here because I'm so strong. I'm not here because I'm so anointed. I'm not here because I'm this or I'm that. I'm here because of perfected weakness because in my weakness, his strength was made perfect. I wanna tell you, if you wanna see the strength of God today, look around you. If you wanna see the arm of God today, look around you. It's gonna be found in somebody that had the courage and the ability and the strength to get up this morning and said, I'm gonna be in the house of God. And when I get there, I'm gonna lift my voice in prayer. I'm gonna lift my voice in praise. I'm gonna be a worshiper. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be connected and plugged in. I'm talking about perfected weakness. Amen, God's grace, his grace. Amen. Two messages were involved in this painful experience. The thorn in the flesh was Satan's message to Paul reminding him of hell's desire to take him down, but God had another message for him and that was a message of grace. 2 Corinthians 12 and nine, a phrase that ought to be underlined in our heart, my grace is sufficient for thee. Yes. And with that, it was enough to disconnect Paul for life. We're through talking about this. Right. I will much rather glory in the things that you are doing. God gave a call, a message that stayed with him. The words that Paul heard, amen, while he was carried away in that other world, we were never permitted to hear. But he did share the words that God gave with him on earth during this storm. It was a message of grace. And there is never a shortage of grace. God is sufficient for our spiritual needs. He is sufficient for our physical needs. God is sufficient for our material needs. Amen. If God is sufficient, if his grace is sufficient to save us, his grace is certainly sufficient to keep us. Amen. God has met my spiritual needs. Has he met yours? God has met our material needs. Has he ever stepped into your life and just met a material need that you had? It was could only be God and he stepped in and God has touched us and met our physical need. When, when nobody else could e even reach to where we were, God just stepped on the scene. Amen. God's grace is sufficient. Amen. It was sufficient to save us and it is sufficient to preserve us. And it can strengthen us in times of suffering. I believe that there are times that in our weakness we can sense his strength because that's where we were. My grace is sufficient. That scripture in another translation said, my grace is sufficient for you for power is perfected in weakness. Strength knows itself to be strength. Strength that knows itself to be strength is most likely weakness. But weakness that knows itself to be weakness, when we know we can't do this if God doesn't intervene, really and truly to me that is strength. And so when Paul prayed these three times for removal of its pain, he was asking God for a substitution. I, I wanna trade out, I wanna tap out. I, I want you to give me health instead of sickness and I want you to give me deliverance instead of pain. But sometimes God, 
And, and sometimes God does that. Sometimes we are the recipient of that exchange, but other times God doesn't just necessarily substitute what we're going through for something else, but God can just move in our lives and transform us. I mean, he doesn't remove the affliction, but he gives us grace so that affliction moves and works for us and not against us. So Paul prayed about his problem and in doing so, he learned that that thorn in his flesh was really a gift from God, a strange gift, but it was a gift from God. It was a gift from God. So Paul said, I'm gonna keep this. And God said, I need you to have this so that you don't get exalted above measure. God has the ability to bring us down. He does. Amen, you just get a little bit lifted up and the Lord has a way of just leveling the playing field, keeping us human. <laughs> Amen. Uh, uh, just a few days ago, we're, my brother and sister Williams, and I heard this story years ago, but I had forgotten about it. <clears throat> and uh, so for many years, of course, most of you know, brother Pat Williams was our district superintendent. Years before that, he was the district secretary. He served on many levels and many capacities. And, and um, so Sister Williams, during a, a part of his tenure, was the ladies' president for the state of Florida, ladies' ministry's president. And so... Um, they were all somewhere, I think in a restaurant, and, and they ran into somebody, some of the saints from another church, and they recognized Sister Williams, and, and uh, they were speaking to her, and this lady was so, uh, just, just so humbled to be able to see her outside of a church setting, and then she looked at Brother Williams, and she said, and I know you. <laughs> she said, you're the guy that carries chairs at ladies' conference. <laughs> He said, yes, ma'am, I am. <laughs> You're the guy that carries chairs at ladies' conference. Yes, ma'am, that's who I am. God has a way of just putting our feet back on the road. And the only thing I hate worse about sharing that story to this with you this morning is that Brother Williams was not here to hear that personally. Because we laughed about that just a few days ago. God always has a special message for people that are afflicted. God really didn't give Paul any explanation. He just gave him a promise. This promise is this. My grace is sufficient. Right. Amen. And so if I could say anything to you today, if I could say anything to me today by way of reminder, is that we don't live on explanations. We live on promises. God doesn't have to explain himself. He's already promised. Amen. Amen. God didn't change the situation by removing the affliction. He changed it by adding a new ingredient. He said, my grace, I'm gonna put grace in this. And so no matter how we look at it, God is, is adequate to meet every need that we have. He is able to do that. He is able to do that. I mean, I'm gonna ask our, our musicians if you would come. According to 2 Corinthians 5 and 1, we read 2 Corinthians 5 and 1. Paul, in the most literal sense, viewed his body as just a, a frail tent. You can, you can read that in your, in your Bible. Just a frail tent. Paul saw himself as nothing special. But the glory of God had come into that tent, what Paul referred to as a frail tent or saw himself as, and he transformed that into a holy tabernacle. Something else happened to Paul. He was able to see glory in his infirmities. And that, I'm not suggesting, and I don't want you to misunderstand me today. I'm not suggesting that Paul now preferred pain to health. I'm not suggesting that at all. But rather... Paul knew how to turn these infirmities into assets. What made that difference? Was it because Paul was made from a different bolt of cloth or no? It was just the grace of God and the glory of God. That's what really made. He took pleasure in those trials and problems, not because he had some psychological imbalance, no, or he enjoyed pain, no, but because he said, I know what this is for. 
And so I may have to suffer here, but God is going to use me greatly here. And I'm so thankful that he was willing to do that. And so from Paul's experience, we can learn several, I think, practical lessons. That the spiritual is far more important to us than the physical. That's not to suggest that we ignore the physical or that our bodies are not important to us, but it does mean that we try not to make our bodies the end and the means of themselves. We're just the vessel through which the Spirit of God flows. God knows how to balance burdens and God knows how to balance blessings. God knows how to balance suffering and he knows how to balance glory because life is something like a prescription. I've received prescriptions from my doctor before that I thought was going to kill me before it healed me. (laughs) Yep. You read not just the label on the prescription, but those 12 other little labels around. It may do this, may do that, may say, well, my Lord, I'm not sure I'm going to survive this. (laughs) But the doctor knew best. And so sometimes the proper blend is going to help us. Not all sicknesses, peril and pain and problems caused by sin, caused by sin, that's You know, the argument of Job's comforters, they really wondered, (laughs) Job, just just tell us. Talk to us. What's going on? Is there something wrong in your life? But their argument was wrong. Their position was wrong in Job's life. That wasn't what was going on. That argument would have been wrong in Paul's life if someone had made that argument. We also should understand that physical affliction doesn't need to be a barrier to effective ministry. God can use you right where you are and he can use you as you are. And who knows? God may have you where you are so that you can reach someone that you would have never met otherwise. Never met. Amen. I've told the story a few times, but I remember many years ago now, um, our son had taken our car was going to holiday youth convention several years ago and the car on the interstate broke down on a Sunday afternoon and I'll ask you to stand if you will and so we we're kind of wondering what you know what in the world's going on and um, we met him on the interstate and we had a triple A come and get the car. Oh, what a rough looking guy was driving that wrecker. Not very talkative at all. And I could tell in an instant we were from two different worlds. Two different worlds. So I, I told him where we were going to take the car. I followed him there back to Lake City. And we got to Lake City. I don't know what happened between where we were on the interstate and when we got to where we were taking the car but it was almost a different man that got out of that record he looked the same but his temperament was so much more mellow and my wife and I had an opportunity to witness to him and just to talk to him about the Lord we had an opportunity to plant the seed I don't know whatever happened to that man he never came here I don't know. One thing I do know that had it not been for that situation, we would have never had that opportunity. Now, what he does with that is between he and God. I mean, but instead of cursing the moment, we need to just look around and say, Lord, do you have me here for a reason? And if so, help me to discover that. Let me not get so caught up in me that I miss you. Amen. Let's love the Lord. Can we do that? Amen. Amen.